Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, it's nice and cool in here. Yes, it is. Yeah. Much better than at my house, I assure you. Yes. We, uh, down here in South Alabama, <laughs> air conditioning can really be a thing that dominates a part of your year. Well, it dominates um, a part of your life, especially when you don't have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's the that's certainly the key point is uh, when it's not working. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't even notice. Well, I came home today to no air conditioning, so get, getting a little later start this evening than I would have liked because I would have been here way earlier if I hadn't have been messing with the air conditioning. Yeah. Good well, news is, I hope I got it working. Yeah. There's no way to know until I, you know, it runs a while and see what it does to the house. Mm-hmm. So, well, I see that you have compensated by putting extra ice in your whiskey tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little heavy on the ice cubes. I feel like I've earned it. I spent all this time yeah. in the heat. Yeah, it seems like you would rather like really enjoy the flavor than kill it with the ice. But whatever. Wow. Need, need some ice, man. <laughs> <laughs> um. I barely remember what we talked about last time. I actually still have my notes, though. Okay, well, yeah, I remember. We talked about Afghanistan, and while I was working on the air conditioner before I left the house today, um, I did see something on the news for the first time, actually, where they mentioned this, that you know that Trump is negotiating the drawdown in Afghanistan. Well, good. Um, um, I mean, I posted a, a yeah off-the-record report earlier this week um, that said that they have a deal and that they're yeah. just going around and telling people now they haven't announced it like publicly. formally and publicly, but yeah. um, that they're, you know, that it, it's done essentially. Yeah. But then right. you get like these generals popping up and saying, well, we can't really you know, pull <laughs> troops out of Afghanistan because, you know, the, the country is just chaos if we're not there. And I'm like, well, what do you call it now? Now, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, and and it was interesting the report that I saw today because they didn't say complete withdrawal. All mm-hmm. they said was was Trump was was negotiating a troop drawdown, mm-hmm. which would mean thousands of troops coming home. Um, so, which is I mean we were hoping for like a complete, and yeah. which is what I mean that's supposed to be their red line, the Afghani's red line, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, well, it's the Taliban. Yeah, the Taliban. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the Afghan government, the Kabul government, yeah. they don't want us to leave. Oh, because they can't, they can't because, defend the country. Yeah. Um. I mean, they're losing more people than they can train. Yeah. And which is the reason? I mean, we're basically there as their training force anyway, right? Well, we're there as the, the national security Army. force. Yeah. 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 Um. I mean, that's not. We don't want to say that. But, but that's. But that's the. Truth what else it. would it be? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the worst part is that like it's so bad that we go out there and we train these people and then they're like okay thanks for the training and they take their weapon and they go back to the taliban like we don't know where these people come from all right we're essentially training the opposition well yeah because uh, a I lot mean, of times uh, how do you how do you even do a background check on that it's not like they can just it's like yeah they they don't <laughs> issue social security numbers in <laughs> it's afghanistan it's not like here where you know you can actually track and find out who somebody is some guy shows up and wants to be in your army you know oh, man ah oh, to live in afghanistan where they don't track you everywhere you go all yeah, right well maybe i wouldn't make that trade off but well yeah i don't know if i'd go that far but <laughs> <laughs> well what i did want to talk about this week though uh, was that there was a a, a big trial concluded? Um, I don't know how much like TV press it's gotten. It's it got a fair bit of print press. It's um, I've, I've seen some stuff on not well actually I haven't seen anything on this case specifically, mm-hmm. but there has been more stuff in the media about the subject. Yeah, well the the case we're talking about is the um, Oklahoma trial uh, Johnson and Johnson. <coughs> Um, was in trial in Oklahoma being accused of, well, they were being tried under the public nuisance laws of Oklahoma for contributing to the opioid crisis there. Huh. All right. Which is weird. Yeah. Um, now, a couple of companies, uh, Purdue, uh, Purdue Pharma, um, they're the makers of OxyContin. That's, That's the, like big, the one. big one. Yeah. Um, Purdue Pharma and an Israeli company called Tiva Pharmaceuticals both settled with the state of Oklahoma. Um, Purdue paid two hundred and seventy million. Uh, Tiva paid eighty five million. And Johnson and Johnson said, uh, "Screw that! We'll go to trial. We're like, gonna, how are we're we gonna, responsible for we're this? We're going to try this. Yeah, yeah." Um, 
So they, uh, apparently they made a nice case and, you know, you do run into the issue of like all of these people are paid by the government and the, the people that get the settlement actually is the government. So I don't know. The whole thing's pretty questionable to me. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, the uh, attorney general there in Oklahoma, Mike Hunter is his name. Um, from what I read, he like, you know, very deftly used the public nuisance laws to to, to bring it to trial yeah, in the first um, place. Yeah, and yeah. then he played on people. You know, everybody wants something to be done, right? Like they've had yeah. um, more than forty five hundred people die in Oklahoma from opioid overdoses in from two thousand seven to twenty seventeen. Well, this, that's part of what makes a lot of this so difficult. So, if you're on that, ju- I'm assuming this was a jury trial. Uh, I, actually, I don't know. Um, the judge handed down the sentence, but I guess they always do so. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting because it's it's almost hard to envision a scenario where that where the the who would it be? I guess the not the prosecution, but the um, defense would be on the pharmaceutical side. Yeah, it was. It's hard to see a scenario where they don't come out on the raw end of the deal because. Uh, so many of these communities are just ravaged with this problem right Mm now and you end up you're it's just hard to believe you'd find a lot of impartial people yeah who are gonna who are gonna look at it impartially well uh that may or may not be the case here what i can tell you is that they um were uh ordered to pay five hundred and seventy two million one hundred and two thousand and twenty eight dollars which is an oddly specific number (laughs) Um, <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> Johnson and Johnson has said that they're going to appeal it. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame them. I think that it's a farce, frankly. Um, I, I can't. <clears throat> so here's here's where I have the problem. And, and you and I argued about this a little bit the other We time. did. So I kind of like you to lay out your case. And, and I don't know how. I, I'm, I'm still kind of... Forming my, some of my opinions on this, but I'd like for you to lay out the case you made the other night. Yeah, well, and I I wish we had that discussion on <laughs> on tape, but um, well, we may have it again. We'll, <laughs> we'll see where this goes. <laughs> true. Uh, so I say that they have no responsibility in this. Yeah. Um, the producer of the product um, doesn't have a responsibility uh, for somebody misusing their product. Yeah. Um, I think it sets a really bad precedent. Um, and I don't understand, like the pharmaceutical company, uh, you know, I would say that, all right, so they certainly didn't want people dying. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think we can settle on the case. Now, well, um, I think that produ- product producers or even service providers uh, have an interest in their customers becoming addicted to their service. I mean, look at like Facebook and Twitter, like they, they yeah. set up, I mean, as just like a very the algorithms kind of, are set up in a way to make you want to pull in. More. Keep looking, keep looking, keep yep. looking. Right. Um, and you know, for a more nefarious, potentially nefarious example, look at tobacco companies. Yeah. Um, but, and so they're, well, let's use tobacco companies as a good example. All right. So, um, they there have been reports, and I don't know whether they're true or not, where they were adding nicotine um, to uh, to cigarettes and and so forth. But one thing that they've definitely been doing is reducing tar and carcinogens. Yeah, right. Because so because they, they the don't want people to die from this. <laughs> yes, like yeah. I mean, while we want you to be addicted, we want you like to, to buy them for as long as possible. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, so um, and. That may or may not be the case here. Uh, like a lot of what they had settled on was that, um, or what the case hinged on, uh, was this idea that they were being deceitful in their marketing, yeah. um, that they were uh, uh, exaggerating the um, the effectiveness of the drug to deal with chronic pain, and that they were downplaying the addictive qualities of the drug, etc. The issue here is that they're not the gatekeepers. It's not like they just put it in a store yeah. and and are you know putting commercials up, although they may be putting commercials Dumb. up. Although I don't really see opioid commercials. I don't really either. And I'll see well, a I lot. don't really watch any TV well, anymore. Well, I don't either, see so. a lot of opioid ones, but I do see ones for the, the side effects that deal with the is it the constipation oh, yeah, or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you are suffering from opioid related constipation, yes. Take there's this. There's a special drug for there, that. There is a, there's there's not just one, there's many. Uh, well. Got a myriad of options. 
Um, there has been a big drawdown. I don't want to use that term. Again. <laughs> right. um, there has been a big drawdown. They're, they have reduced the number of prescriptions that they're writing since about like 2010, 2011, when this clearly started was blowing up, being a real problem. Yeah. Although, I mean, it's been a problem since essentially this century. Yeah, like I was going to say the early 2000s, mm-hmm. it started like, and I was, yeah. I, I witnessed it start. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I say I witnessed it start. I mean, I was aware of it then when it was going on. I yeah. mean, I didn't know where all of us was going to lead. Yeah. But so I'm not doing a very good job of laying out the argument, though. I'm, I, I keep providing background. So let me lay out the argument. All right. The argument. argument is that while Johnson and Johnson produces this drug, uh, they're not responsible for the abuse. Of the drug, yeah. Um, there are a couple of things that happened. Uh, first off, um, this had to pass clinical trials and be approved by the FDA yeah. before it could go to market. That's that's really the big one, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, Just put a pin in that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll we'll definitely spend more time on that. I'll tell you what you have to do to get FDA yeah. approval. It's, it's yeah, it ain't um, easy. No. Um, and in fact, only something like one in 5,000 drugs that's developed or something like that gets FDA approval in the end. So yeah. it, it's not a huge number. Um, <coughs> so it, the FDA said it could go to market. And then in, for everybody that has a legal, that, that is using the drug legally, yeah. got a prescription from a licensed physician. Yeah. Right. So Johnson & Johnson isn't out there peddling it on the street. Yeah. Um, the the FDA approved the drug, said that it was effective and safe yeah. to some standard that was measurable. To um, and the doctors are prescribing the drug, yeah. and they can say, well, you know, they're bringing these doctors down to Miami and you know flying them in for these conferences and selling it to them. Yeah. All these doctors have a professional obligation to know what they're prescribing to their patients, yeah. and all of those clinical trials, like all of the studies that have been done on this drug, are available to them. Which is where me and you got in the tiff the other night, because I I know from just some of the research I've done and some of the things I've seen that a, the doctors' side of the story, because there's doctors in jail for this, make no mm-hmm. mistake. There are many doctors that are in jail for overprescribing these drugs. Um, and the argument that they're going to make and what they say is that, look, the information that there's there's tons of information out there. But the information that I've used and was going by said that these drugs were safe, that they were they were there to prescribe to people with with pain issues. Mm-hmm. This is a pain management drug. And so their argument would be that, you know, it, it's not on them to know that, you know, the doctors would say that. Oh, I yeah. Well, no, it's it's not that it's not on them, but their argument is that that these drugs were released for pain management, and that's what they were prescribing them for. Yeah, I mean, that's, and, and they work. Yeah, and they work, much. and they well, they work for. A, I think that the study. I think you would see now that at least they would say that they work for a period of time, but mm-hmm. you get you hit a point with them where you have to take so many, and um. But the yeah. but that's but that's what the doc, the doctors that are in jail that's what their the crux of their argument is is like look I was prescribing these to people who said they needed them and mm-hmm. whose symptoms said they needed them yeah you know well and like I said all of the all the clinical trials all of that research is available to those yeah. doctors yeah. Um, they and they the, have the research and the, this kind of effect from an opioid is not a surprise. Yeah. Like, we've known about this for 150 years or something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you started with opium, uh, like laudanum and, and so forth in the mid-19th century in this country. It was like a really popular drug. Yeah. Um, morphine, heroin, like all of these things. And, and what they found is that there is a direct relationship between its efficacy as a pain reliever yeah. and its addictiveness. Yeah. So well, the, you... the more effective it is as a pain reliever, the more <coughs> addictive the drug is. My understanding, though, is you hit a point with those drugs once you're like actually addicted mm-hmm. where you have to have it just – you will start developing pains you didn't have. When you start coming off the drug, like if you quit taking it. Oh, I mean, that's true that's, of almost any physical addiction. Though. Well, exactly. I mean, it is. But that's that's part of why these drugs shouldn't, in my opinion, shouldn't be prescribed that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I don't think that you should be taking those if you've got, there, there, it's just a dangerous road to go down. Well. And anybody I know that's been prescribed these, I always tell them that. I'm like, look, you really need to be careful taking those mm-hmm. because that's, it's a dangerous road. And I've seen a lot of people go down it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it it happens. It ain't gonna happen to anybody. Yeah. Well, there's a, a level of laziness involved in both sides, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's lazy doctors that aren't looking for an alternative answer. Yeah. And in my experience with with a lot of physical pains like that, yeah. um, the best thing that you can do is therapy. Is yeah. actual physical therapy. Is going out there and working whatever yeah. part of the body. I mean, I had shoulder issues yeah. uh, to the point where I could barely lift my arm. Yeah. Um, and I went and got a, I, I never took any painkillers actually. I went and got a steroid shot in my shoulder and then I did two months of physical therapy. And, and now you can and lift I, your arm over your head. And now I can lift my arm over my head <laughs> and I can lift something in my hand with that arm over yeah. my head. Um, and I, you know, I've kept working. Yeah. I, I mean, like I, I finished my physical therapy. Oh, it's been close to a year, I guess now. I mean, it was a long it's time ago. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, um, but I, you know, I've continued to work my shoulder. Um, like I do the exercises and yeah. I had pain's gone. Yeah. Like, it hasn't come back. Yeah. Um, now I did get a little lazy, like not long after my physical therapy was over where I wasn't really doing the exercises and the pain started to come and back. And you could feel it coming back. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I started working again and, and it has gone away and I've continued to work and it stayed away. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other side of that is that I was one of those patients that was like, I don't want to take painkillers. Are there... What else yeah. can we do? What are the other options? Um, well, do you want to spend eight weeks working your butt off three days a week? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? And I said, yeah. If that's gonna, what's really gonna yeah. fix me? That, yeah, if that'll help. Yes, absolutely. So there's lazy patients out there too that are like, oh come on, can't you just give me a pill? Yeah, no. And, um, and that's how you end up down those roads. But I just, I still, I, I st- I'm still where I'm at the other night where I have a hard time sending doctors to jail over this when when there was a lot of information out there to be to be delved through and and all of this is open to interpretation you know i mean it's not i mean yeah there's studies telling you one thing but then you've got other studies telling you another and you as a doctor have to make a decision you do how how are you going to proceed they're the professional though they are um and here's the other thing like to be fair a lot of the doctors that are in jail yeah. Are in jail because they were prescribing them like yeah. mad to people who didn't need them. Yeah. Um, well, as well, and, and we're the, we're fueling a black market in these drugs the, too. Well, yeah, and that I, I can't really condone, obviously. But um, and the stuff I was watching the other day and and, and I've heard about was in Florida because apparently yeah. this was a big deal in Florida where they had these they were calling them pill mills and they what they were were pain management clinics and basically all it was was you went in you saw somebody. You said, I've got X pain, and they write you a script. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, and that's been a big part. Now, that wasn't a part of this case. Yeah. Uh, you know, the issue that I heard several people have brought up to me, and I think you did too, actually, yeah. was that they were sending, the manufacturers were sending, like, so many of these pills to particular areas that it yeah. was way more than the population of that area could possibly yeah. need. And I forget what exactly the numbers were in Florida, but it was like so many pills, like 20 something pills per person or something mm-hmm. for like the whole state of Florida. All those pills are going into one place. Yeah. Like that's, and, and that's kind of where I can at least get where they're coming from in this case where they're like, look, these, these people who were producing these pills should have realized mm-hmm. that, there's way more here than the population could, and should at least have asked some questions yeah. and been like, you know, why are we sending this many pills to this area and nowhere else? Yeah. Well, I, and I, while that wasn't a part of this case, that is something that I, I'm happy to address yeah. here. And there's a couple of things. First off, I imagine that the company isn't looking at number of pills. Yeah. They're just looking at revenue. I'm sure. And yeah. so to the people that, that have the information to like notice this kind of thing. Yeah. They're probably not like, not Oh, well there's 20 it, pills yeah. per person in Florida. They're like, Oh, well we generated $2 billion in revenue in yeah. the last three well, months in Florida. That's, and that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and have them worked for businesses and, and done stuff like that. You're probably right. I mean, it's it all is where the gatekeepers at, mm-hmm. you know, and there's probably not anybody monitoring how much is going where, mm-hmm. or maybe, uh, but maybe there should be. But then again, who is the government to come in and tell you that? Well, I mean, that's what the government should be doing. Right? Like the manufacturer isn't supposed to be enforcement also. So they're yeah. supposed to produce it and keep track of who all is using it and whether they're using it right or not. Yeah. No, there's two different government agencies that have 
uh, some jurisdiction over the distribution of these drugs yeah. of the because they're opioids. Not, yeah. um, now, any prescription drug is under the FDA, so the FDA tracks all well, this stuff to begin with. And it, with the opioids, the DEA is involved also. Yeah. Like there's supposed to be like really close records of where these drugs are going and how they're you know how and how many leaving. of them are out there. Right. Yeah. Um, so why is it this company's obligation to keep track of that stuff and not, you know, the two government agencies that are supposed to be responsible for this? Which is kind of where our conversation went the other night because I was, like I was telling you, um, I mean, I, to me it should be on the um, uh, which, on the people who approved the drug to mm-hmm. begin with. When, they, when the drug was approved, it should have been laid out specifically how it needed to be dosed and how much. And mm-hmm. I mean, I... Well, I mean, that should be a part of it. This is... So I did some research into the requirements to bring a drug to market through the FDA. Yeah. And this is what I found. Um, okay. So there's there's a bunch of steps to this. Yeah. So almost from the very beginning, you got to do preclinical testing. That Like the first stage essentially is preclinical testing. Yeah. Where they're doing um, just lab work uh, and they're testing on animals. And they're, they're just testing for safety and... and it's not really effectiveness. It's just like, are you getting a biological response? Yeah. Or, or a chemical response? Like, is it is it is affecting it actually something? doing anything? Yeah. Is yeah. it affecting something? Yeah. Um, only about one in a thousand of the drugs developed pass from preclinical testing to clinical yeah. trials. That's the reason um, you always hear X drug just made clinical trial yeah. or whatever, because not very many do. And that first part, the preclinical testing. Yeah. Um, takes on average three and a half years. Wow. They do three and a half years on average of preclinical testing yeah. before they then apply to the FDA to be permitted to conduct clinical trials. Yeah. Um, now the way that works is like typical lazy government thing. You yeah. send in your application, and if they don't reject it in thirty days, it's assumed that it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, if they ignore you for thirty days, no matter what situation is, you get to start clinical trials. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but then, then there's several phases of clinical trials. Yeah. So the first phase is on a, a small testing group. Um, they tested on healthy people um, to find uh, the safe dosage range um, and, Dial the, it in. and biological activity and make sure it's actually doing something in a human body. Yeah. Um, that's about a year of testing. Yeah. Um, if things go well, then they move to phase two. Uh, they're doing larger studies with actual patients that have the problem that they're trying to treat. Yeah. Um, and they uh, they use that time period to determine um, minimum, maximum dosage and the real efficacy of the drug on the the problem yeah. that they're trying to treat. Um, th- that takes about two years. Additional years. Right? Additional like, years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then if things go well there, then they move on to phase three. Large, randomized, blind trials. Um, again... Uh, testing efficacy and safety that you know blind trials means they also have people taking placebos Um, they're documenting uh, side effects or possible side effects both from the people that are taking the actual drug and the people that are taking the placebo because people will report stuff even if they're (laughs) taking a sugar pill yeah you know um so then that takes approximately three years and if things went well there then they uh, send a new drug application to the fda for review with all the information gathered all the research gathered to that point um these documents as i understand it are usually about a hundred thousand pages of i mean i can can imagine because i mean there's there's a lot to be documented there with what you just laid out Mm -hmm. and about 20 percent of the drugs that that proceeded to clinical trials because yeah. like I said only about one in a thousand go from preclinical to clinical yeah. um, out of those that go to clinical about 20% so uh, in total about one in 5,000 drugs that are developed actually is approved by the FDA but even that approval process this 100,000 pages of documentation <laughs> that they got to review takes yeah. a, about two and a half years yeah. all told the average time from development to market is about 12 years. Wow. There's 12 years worth of research and information before that drug is allowed to go to market. Yeah. All right. That's a, that's a lot of time. And, and which, when it's at market, all these doctors that are prescribing it, they have access to all of that research. Yeah. Which you end up with, it, this kind of makes my argument for me though, you end up with information overload there. Like mm-hmm. you really have to, because a lot of the doctors they interview that I've seen them interview 
have talked about, well, you know, I went, I went to these training seminars and this is what they said. Like they said that this was okay to do, you know, and you know, I granted, like you said, there's a lot of research and stuff that Mm -hmm. has to be done, but you're talking about doctors that prescribe all kinds of drugs. I mean, you're asking a lot. Well, they don't have to prescribe the new drug. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and this is one of the things, uh, makes me think now that they're advertising, uh, pharmaceuticals prescription drugs on television yeah um which blows my mind well i mean i don't have i don't have a problem with it particularly here's here's the rub though um it's when you as a patient start going to the doctor and telling them what to prescribe you yeah right um and cara santa maria (coughs) used to say if if i'm going to the drug doctor and telling him what drug to give me is he still my doctor or is he now my drug dealer yeah exactly um and so there, there's a problem there, but the whole point is that the doctor is supposed to be the person knowledgeable. And if they don't know any better, then they shouldn't prescribe the new drug. They should yeah. stick with the thing that's worked yeah. forever. Yeah. Um, well, that the, they've been prescribing for the last ten years. The, they need to keep up. Yeah. Like I mean, I oh, hope absolutely. that they're like reading. If they're if they're hearing over and over again, oh, there's this great new drug that does this thing. I yeah. would hope that they would take take the time when they get off work yeah. because they get paid the big bucks after all. Oh yeah. Uh, that when they get or when they have time between patients or whatever, while they're making me wait in the <laughs> in the uh, examination room, yeah. that maybe they're like you know flipping through some of this research and yeah. trying to catch up on what's going on yeah. and determine for themselves whether something's good or not. Well, and then even then. And this is what I would do if I were a doctor. Yeah. Even then, I wouldn't prescribe it to all my patients that have this problem. Yeah. I would which, pick a few of them which and say, is, hey, there's this new drug. Yeah. It seems to be working pretty well. Yeah. Um, you know, this is what I would like to give you if you're okay with it. There may be some side effects, and I want you to tell me if anything feels wrong. Like, this is yeah. how you This is how, you this is how this, this should work, yeah. yeah. And I don't disagree with you on, really on any of that. I just – I do have a problem, though – lock in doc but just because there was so much misinformation out there mm-hmm. at the time when all this was going on but here here's what i absolutely do believe something does have to be done here because the this is a epidemic at this point i mean it's well it's bad they have done some things and yeah. it hasn't worked yeah. because well, they have tightened both federal and insurance regulations on prescriptions uh, of these types yeah. um, and they have lowered the prescription rates significantly yeah and as they lowered the prescriptions rate prescription rates the death rates rose really yes that's um, because well i mean what happened was the yeah. the people that were using these drugs that were addicted to them yeah. uh, couldn't get their prescription anymore and yeah. so they moved to illicit more dangerous versions yeah they moved to heroin yeah. And well, what have you. Because that's and that well and that's where the real problem is with all of this, because mm-hmm. that's that's what this has escalated to. And I'm mm-hmm. not a believer in the whole like gateway drug thing. No. But that is kind of where some well, of Well, they leads moved from that. one type they, they didn't change drugs. They just yeah. moved from a legal Change. version to an illegal version. Well, they, they, they changed they potency. Changed, yeah. They changed their provider. Yeah. That's what they there did. There you go. Yeah. Um and so I mean that's that's certainly an issue and uh, I think that we recognize that there's definitely a problem. But is the the person that produced the drug responsible for people misusing the drug? Yeah. And so what I would say is to apply that more broadly. Yeah. Because there's a chain of responsibility here. And yeah. I would say that it starts with the person who abused the drug. Well, obviously. Like, they're the person yeah. that made the, the biggest mistake. Yeah. Um, and once you started to feel like you really needed this, then you probably should have told somebody. Um, Absolutely, and said, "Wait, I think that there might be a problem." Yeah. All right, yeah. and but, but they, maybe they were having too good a time. Who knows? Yeah. Well, um, and, and if it's usually, working, it's working. You know, I mean, well, because I've, I've heard stories of people telling me, and I, in fact, I know a couple of people right now mm-hmm. that are on these type of drugs, and they they can't function without them. Yeah, like I mean, what and what are they supposed to really do? Mm-hmm. Like I mean, because, well, and I don't want to speculate too much on this because I, I want to move to what I think is the bigger issue. Yeah. Um. But I, I have seen people that they aren't following the directions. Yeah. That they well, are like and okay, the pe- the people well, I know now, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and take another one. Oh, it says don't take it with alcohol. Well, that's all right. I'm gonna take it down with this shot of whiskey and. And, um, and you know. to be completely truthful, with you, the people that I know that are in this boat right now mm-hmm. are those people. Yeah. I mean, they don't take more than four a day. Ah, uh, well, you know, well, it takes me six, six to get through yeah, the day. Exactly. I mean, I, I kind of take what I need, you know. Yeah. 
And and a lot of that is on them. I mean, I fully agree with that. Yeah. I need but, it to hit fast, so I'm going to chew it up. You, yes. There's like all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But here's the issue. So they're the most responsible. Yeah. The next level, the real gatekeeper, is the prescription is the writers. doctor. It's the doctor. Yeah. yeah. Um, the manufacturer, they're just providing a drug that actually helps out a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Like they're doing a good thing. And I don't know why they're the person, they're the the entity that's most responsible for covering the cost of the damages done. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what the answer to that question is. And I, not that I necessarily agree with this, but the answer to that question is because is that's where the money's at. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get that money from the doctors. Absolutely. You well, obviously. You could, but you take it takes a lot more trials. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's just it. You'd have mm-hmm. to, and and even then, you're not going to get the money that's needed to fix this problem from the doctors. You'll end up with a lot of them in jail, mm-hmm. um, which has already happened, um, some at least. Yeah. Um, but you're the, the place you get the money mm-hmm. is from the the providers, and that's exactly it. And I would make the exact same point actually. Yeah. That the reason that you go after the pharmaceutical company is because it's the single entity with the deepest pockets. Exactly. Follow the money. Um, and they're also the most likely to settle and just yeah. give you a bunch well, of money. Well, and like I said, so this went to trial, but mm-hmm. they have been settling these cases out of court for a while now. Well, there's another 1,500 to 2,000 lawsuits filed in state, local, and tribal governments. Yeah. against pharmaceutical companies. I haven't read and up on it, but I think there's a few here locally. I, that's probably true. Now, here's another thing that I want to want to note before I want to go back and apply the yeah. results of this more widely, right? Yeah. Um, something that I want to point out is that they had this $572 million and change settlement yeah. um, that, well, not settlement, uh, penalty, yeah. I, I guess, um, fine, I, yeah. whatever. Anyway... This isn't going to the families of the people of the deceased people or anything the like victims. that. The victims. This is this is going to the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. And not only is this going to the state of Oklahoma. Now the state of Oklahoma is supposedly going to use it for abatement of the problem. They're gonna you know build sports centers and whatever. All these now, things, after yeah. they take their you know ten twenty percent bureaucratic cut off the top. <coughs> not only that, the state of Oklahoma hired a private um, attorney firm to help prosecute the case. Really? Yes. And that private attorney firm is entitled to a quarter of oh, the I payments. That they are, because those guys don't come cheap. Nope. So, you know, roughly that's $170 million wow. that they're going to get. That's that, crazy That's before to the me. state gets it. it that's piece. before it gets any, yeah. Now, even then, though, the state doesn't get necessarily the rest of that. Because the U.S. Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid told the state of Oklahoma that the the federal government is entitled to a portion of that settlement um, because you know they're having to pay for this stuff as well, right? Wow. So then the federal government's going to take a piece of, and presumably yeah. if this happens all over the place, the federal government's going to take a piece of the one in Oklahoma, the every one in one Arizona, the yep. one in Ohio, yep. and every single one. Right? That's crazy. So this they is have a, to get their hands in it. They can't not. Yeah. They can't not. Yeah. Um, so there, huh. there is a big money side of this oh, as yeah. well. Um, yeah. That you know, essentially, they're using these these private companies uh, to fund a whole bunch of federal government programs. Yeah. Um, which you know, from my perspective, is well, why don't you just cut out the middleman, like yeah. take the federal, take the government out of it entirely, and let yeah. private companies provide these programs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's what we would not say. have to pay a bunch of bureaucrats to yeah. you know move yeah. money around. Exactly. Right? Um, but here's the the problem that I see going forward. Um, so if you start if you start with the premise or with the precedent, I should say, of yeah. this trial, which is what says, this is, yeah, yeah it, that and you apply it beyond just the pharmaceutical case. Yeah. If you're saying that the manufacturer of a product is responsible, legally responsible for any damages caused as a result of the misuse of that product, yeah, then it opens up business. To a lot of what I would call frivolous lawsuits, but like 
legitimate lawsuits. Now, yeah. you can make the argument that, okay, they should have known what was going on. They probably should have reported it to somebody. There was way too many pills going to these places, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So you can say, I think, very reasonably that they had a moral – and I, I think I've used this line on the podcast for something else before. Yeah. They have moral responsibility, yeah. that they have an ethical responsibility to, to report these things. Yeah. But they don't have a legal responsibility. Yeah. I don't think that they have a legal responsibility because I don't think that they're liable. Yeah. And the reason I don't think they're liable is because I don't think any producer should be liable for the misuse of their product. Yeah. And what you can then – you can look at this going forward, especially in the current environment with a lot of attacks on the Second Amendment. Say, OK, how do we apply this to firearms, right? Yep. So now if there's deaths uh, due to people going around and, and shooting each other, like these things that happen from time to time, like more regularly than they should, but yeah. not as regularly as they would have you believe. Anyway – yeah. That's another topic. But anyway, so now is the the firearm manufacturer responsible for that? Is the ammo manufacturer responsible for that? Do I, we are we able to use these kind of trials brought by the governments uh, in this country to shut down those companies? Yeah. And there's already <clears throat> been some of that. I mean, there's been some lawsuits against Remington and um Another big one. I don't remember. Smith & Wesson, maybe? Or I don't think it was Smith & Wesson. I don't know. I don't There's know. been a few of these, though, where these guns have been used in in shootings and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And the families have tried to go back and sue these companies. And I think a lot of it, I'd have to read up because I haven't, are mm-hmm. still in litigation now. Yeah. Um, but but you're... you're you're absolutely right. That's that's the road. If if you're setting this type of president, that's mm-hmm. that's the road you go down. Yeah. I mean, that's you know. I mean, I don't remember um, them calling for people's heads when they had the hoverboards that were catching fire, or the cell phones, or whatever yeah, that were catching the fire. Were I mean, there were, up, yeah. there were some there were some lawsuits, but not to this level. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was plenty of problems with it, and so and and in that case. It was a defect. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't well, a defect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is, well, this is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> um, and you can apply the misuse thing to all kinds of things. I oh, mean, yeah. even like spray paint. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you can misuse spray paint by huffing it and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, are you going to hold the spray paint company liable? I mean, they put warning labels all over the package. Don't forget whipped cream. Whipped cream. Oh, man, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how many warning labels are on the whipped cream, but I know the spray, the reason I know the spray paint one so well is because I've got signs on the shelf, there's signs on the, on, all over the can, mm-hmm. and when I scan it at the register, a warning thing pops up, yeah. letting me know the customer needs to be aware, they don't need to huff this. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. Well, I mean, my microwave, uh, has warnings in three languages. Yeah. All right. Um, the, uh, English one is like two paragraphs Yeah, you know, it's don't pour water in this machine. <laughs> don't stick metal objects in this, you know, like all kinds of just ridiculous things. Yeah. Um, now if I violate some of that, can I still sue the microwave company? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I misused their product. They even told me plainly that I shouldn't do this. Yeah. And if I did it anyway, Which in Spanish, is the... it's like a, it's like a sentence. It's like, you know, this is an, uh, electrical device. Be careful with electrical device. Um, yeah. The French one is like a single phrase. It just says, take care. Take care. <laughs> that's my favorite. Yeah. Uh, but that's the, that's the country we live in is where mm-hmm. you, have to, you have to cover yourself from every single angle. If you don't, you're going to have attorneys coming Well, and we're you. so litigious that it doesn't even matter if you cover yourself from every single angle. Or you're still going to get sued. You're still going to get, yeah. And, you know, the, like the court system costs so much that big companies like this are generally better off settling. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm glad Johnson and Johnson fought it, and they yeah. said they're gonna they're gonna take it to appeal. And there's there's another part of this. So just think about you know in terms of holding a manufacturer responsible for the misuse of their product and how that can be applied elsewhere. Yeah. So that's a very dangerous precedent. Yeah, that's okay. that's a scary road to go down. And there's another part of this that's even even more frightening. I think um, the there was. Uh, some discussion in this trial about First Amendment privileges because they were talking about the marketing. Like a big part of it was them talking about the marketing and like I said, um, maybe exaggerating or uh, promoting the the efficacy of the product while downplaying the addictive qualities of the product. Um, And so uh, the, they, you know, Johnson Johnson claims that, you know, this is, 
This is First Amendment. This is this is marketing, though, is what it is. We yeah. produced a product, and we want to sell as much of the product as we can. And so when we're out there trying to sell it, we're going to tell people mostly about how good it is. Yeah. And we're going to try and and you know talk around or downplay the things that may go wrong because yeah. we want to sell the product, just like any other marketer is going to well, do in any with any other product. With any other product, and it <clears throat> goes back. It's almost the same thing with like the tobacco because. Obviously, it's kind of up to you to read the warning labels mm-hmm. as as a consumer, and yeah. and it'd be the same way with these drugs. Like, mm-hmm. so I mean, obviously on TV you're going to hear about all the positive things. Yeah, but, but at the end of the all of the yeah, yeah they run <laughs> really fast at the end in tiny little print, and they say yeah. it really quickly. Yeah, um, but it goes back know, to what you were saying cause, earlier. Blah 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 blah. Anal bleeding and whatever. But that's where it goes back to what you were saying earlier. You need to talk to your doctor or the person, yeah, whoever the gatekeeper is. And if it, yeah. even if it's not a product like this, mm-hmm. I mean, you still read the warning labels because they're required to be put on there for a reason. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I, I I'm paranoid anyway. So anytime yeah. I get a prescription that I've never taken before. I like pull out that giant sheet. You read sheet. the book, right? Yeah, I read all the things that can go wrong and I and then yeah. I get, you know, paranoid about it. All up I in your head. Wait, did that just happen? Psychosomatic symptoms like did I <laughs> is my eyesight getting blurry or maybe I well, it's been too long since I've gotten my glasses checked. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's the drug. Maybe it's the drug. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, um but they so Johnson and Johnson says that their way of presenting this, their marketing essentially, yeah. um, is protected speech because they're presenting one side of a public debate. That's how yeah. that they were taking it. Yeah. Um, this was essentially dismissed by the court. Right. Um, and so then you have this other question. like, Does that mean if you apply this in a, in a wider context? So are advocates of something responsible for any harm done by doing whatever it was that they're advocating for. So once like again, generally. apply it to the Second Amendment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Are, are, so are Second Amendment advocates responsible for any deaths caused by firearms? Well, um, people on the other side of the argument would say yes. Well, yeah. And they do, it's loudly. Yeah. Um, but I, I see <laughs> but they're not is, right. They're no, wrong. No, no, no. It's, yeah. it's, it's an absurd idea that, uh, yeah. I mean, first off, in a lot of cases, how would you know? And yeah. secondly... Most of the time, these kind of damages are caused by people misusing the product or not following, not not doing what was advocated exactly. Yeah. Um, it may be the the thing that's advocated, but not the behavior that's advocated. Yeah. Because people that are promoting Second Amendment aren't promoting people going around and shooting people. No. They're promoting the ability to defend yourself. Exactly. Um, so it you can it, it can be taken out of context though and applied in this weird way. And I think that. Going forward, what it does is it starts to t- it takes a step towards criminalizing dissent. Yeah. Right. So if I'm if I am being a dissenter in terms of the Second Amendment, if yeah. if all of the government is pushing for more and more gun regulation, and I'm out there promoting people's ability to defend themselves, to make their own choices of how they can best defend themselves, yeah. then. Going down, like following this path further, yeah, I could be declared a criminal. Yeah, just for, just just for having an opinion, basically, yeah. and it yeah. not being the opinion that the government the promotes. proper opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and in in the climate that we're in right now, I think that that's fairly. Yeah, yeah, we're, I think that's fair to worry about. I mean, it is. you've already had actual politicians talking about jailing people for dissenting on climate change. Yeah, for saying that they're you know that climate change isn't something to worry about. Well. That, you know, yeah. these people should be put in jail. Well, what are you talking about? Exactly. And it goes back to the whole social media thing, too, mm-hmm. because that's that's where they're really trying to push for more of that is mm-hmm. calling what, what you say on social media, you know, hate speech, even though it's nothing close to that. Well, and the whole idea of hate speech is just absurd to me anyway. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, well, or hate crimes are even worse. Like, oh, if it's don't. a crime, it's a crime. <laughs> yeah. Right? The, the intent of the crime is not really relevant in yeah. in terms of making it a worse crime exactly. like a crime is a crime yeah. now i think the intent can be relevant in making it a less lesser crime 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, that's the purpose of having judges, right? Judges aren't supposed to be computers that just like apply things well, exactly this way. <laughs> the whole idea is not that they'd be objective. It's yeah. that the people that you can most trust to be subjective about the totality of the situation. Yeah. That's the point of being a judge. Well, and that's that's where mandatory minimums and stuff like that become, which yeah. is falls right in there with your hate crime thing. Because that's yeah. usually what happens is that the hate crimes attach a mandatory minimum. Right. So... Um, well, we should wrap We're this up We're down rabbit soon. holes now. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I'm, my drink's gone too, so. Uh, As is mine. But I did want to comment. A, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some things and went down one of these rabbit holes. And I, I just wanted to make the point here um, that I am not anti-cop. Ah. All right. Like, I'm not anti-cop. I am anti the blue wall of silence. Yeah. I'm anti the system that makes it possible for uh, police to be unaccountable for their own crimes. Yeah. That's what I'm against. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of good police out there that work hard. But the, here's another thing that I would say. Those of you that are out there, and I know that this can be really dangerous, if you are one of the good ones and one of the bad ones does something bad in front of you, like the you story that I told. You have a moral obligation to stand up and say something. Yes. And I, I know that you're going to get fired or get the worst possible job in the precinct. and what, like I understand yeah. that. There will be repercussions. But... But you have to, like, if you are really one of the good ones, you have to stand up when when your brothers do something illegal. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And and that I'm pretty well where you are with that. Like, I mean, I, I get frustrated with a lot of stuff I see as far as the police go. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's that's part of the problem with the system is is the wall of silence, the blue wall, whatever you call it, yeah. the wall of silence, because that's. That's what permits this to continue on. Yeah. And what and what we need is more cops that are willing to stand up mm-hmm. and say something when something's wrong. Yeah. Because you, you guys think you're poorly treated by the community. You want to be respected by the community. You gotta be you gotta be worthy of respect. Yeah. Yeah. I I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. Um and, and there are things that every cop out there can do to do to facilitate that. Mm-hmm. You know. It's just but you don't see much of it. I'm just telling yeah. you, you don't. Yeah, um, it's unfortunate, and like I said, I, I know that they're. You know, I grew, I grew up in a law enforcement family. Yeah, I um, mean, yeah, you come from so, us, so. Like, I understand the the danger uh, that you potentially put yourself in, and so forth. And like I said, I, I did want to make it really clear that I'm not anti cop. What I'm opposed to is a system that permits not just police, but but government employees generally to commit crimes and be unaccountable for them. Yeah. Well, and uh, if we want to go down a little rabbit hole here real quick, sure. a big part of the problem with this... a few minutes. This, I, I'm not... I'm, <laughs> I don't, not, have, the, I don't not, have the DTs yet. You're not yeah. that thirsty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, a big part of the problem, though, is all the laws and stuff that they're required to enforce. Mm-hmm. A big way to reform the police departments would be to reform a lot of the laws. Mm-hmm. And, and if you only had police enforcing... Um, acts property of violence, and, yeah. yeah. Property crimes and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, acts of there would, yeah, there would be a lot of this would fix itself. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I big problem like the drug war is a huge part of this. Yep. Um, a big problem is that there are a bunch of laws that are enforceable proactively. Yep. Where you can go chase somebody down and see if they're breaking the law. Yeah. Rather than you know well, doing any kind of investigative and, work or whatever, and usually it's a law that's not really hurt. in those situations. It's a law that's not actually hurting anybody. Yeah, the fact that there's a like, law is what creates crime. Yeah, like selling loose cigarettes on the side of a bodega. Yeah, uh, you know that they um, they fired that guy. Yes, they and did. The the New York police or doing a protesting about slowdown. It. Man, um, so yeah, I heard about that today actually, about the slowdown. I'm like, man, like that whole story is just insane. Yeah. The whole but the whole idea that that they're going to punish the community by enforcing less laws yeah, well, is like yeah. it was well, like the libertarian <laughs> dream. Ahead, take it's, the day off, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't threaten me with a good time. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I it's that the whole deal there is insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should. I mean, uh, there's going to be plenty of opportunity to talk about government abuse generally, yeah. um, and law enforcement specifically. And it's, it, yeah. it's you know, I'm sorry to pick on law enforcement about this, but they're just the most obvious ones because well, they are the violent arm of the government. Well, they're they're that they're that wing of the government. I mean, they're the enforcement wing. Yeah. And 
I mean, they can they can say, you know, I'm just doing my job all they want, but you, everybody, and I believe this about every person everywhere, you make a decision every day, whether you're going to get up and go to your job, whether you're not, whether, mm-hmm. we're all make decisions all day long. And, and every cop makes the decision that they're going to enforce these laws, whether mm-hmm. they believe in them or not. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, it's okay just to let things go sometimes. Yeah. And, and exactly. Um, I think if a lot more people let a lot more stuff go, we'd live in a better, better world. Yeah. I just, and I believe that. Yeah. Like not just police, just everybody. Just everybody <laughs> in general. Like yeah. you don't have to jump and pounce on everything you see. Mm-hmm. Just let it go. Yeah. Life know. is good. That's that's just my philosophy, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so I, I was talking politics because I'm always talking politics. I, I was talking politics with a friend of mine last weekend, and um, and we were arguing something about the libertarian thing. And frankly, I'm a little confused by his position. Anyway, his position was that the the libertarian ideology is too utopian, and since we could never reach that utopia, he he doesn't agree with it. Wow. I'm like, well, no, you have to have a direction to move in. Like, it's all yeah. ideological, right? In yeah. the end, you you pick your best possible world and you do what you can to get there. To, to build it's that. It's not an expectation yeah. to actually reach it. Well, I mean, I'm an anarcho-capitalist because ideally <coughs> I think that that would be the best. Do I think that that's pragmatic? No, I don't. Yeah. But I'm going to do everything I can to move in that direction. Yeah. The, closest, the, the closer we get to that, the better off we'll be. Yeah. But that's not really the point of all this. Um, he asked me, because I was talking about all these abuses in government and uh and you know the overreach of government in this country and and talking about how you know the country was founded on an uh, on a fairly libertarian ideal of very small very limited government only involved in specific things uh federal government being really outward facing not inward facing etc and tied down Yeah. yeah um and he he asked me well if i could choose any time to live like if i'm if i'm so dissatisfied with how things are going right now if i could choose any time to live uh in history what would it be well and i i said right now well it would absolutely it would absolutely be now but not because of what government has done it's no, because no. of what technology has done yeah absolutely and it's what, what the free capitalism done. has done yeah it's I what mean, the free market yeah. done but what um, we're living in now wasn't built now capitalism wise yeah. it was built decades and decades i mean it's it was built way before now yeah like, I, i'm i'm not on board with the leibniz thing this isn't the best of all possible worlds oh no but um i, I will say that there has never been a better time to be alive oh absolutely and so i i just wanted to like let's end on a positive note there like since we're yeah. so bad at ending on positive <laughs> notes <laughs> right. i just wanted to say that like this is the best time to be alive oh without this question. is the best time to be alive so yeah. just remember that every day when you're like Letting it go. Exactly. I like that theme. So, uh, all right. Well, let's, um, we'll do all our little plugs then. Uh, you know, follow us everywhere. Um, Facebook, uh, iTunes, Podbean, wherever. Um, check the website from time to time. I'm not making any promises about writing articles, but I really do intend to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> You'll well, see them on Facebook, and we're going to be more active on Facebook. Like I yeah, said, I'm you've been to doing better. Articles. I'm going to try to do better too. Uh, just things that I'm reading um, that I think are valuable. Um, I mean, I, I certainly hope that the Judge Napolitano article oh, was interesting to some of you. It was to me. I enjoyed them immensely. Well, good. Um, so yeah, we're going to try and and just you know just get some content up. Uh, since we can't entirely fill it in with original content, it's going to be, you know, content from other places, certainly, but, um, hope you guys enjoy that. And if you're interested in some podcasts, actually let me know because from time to time I hear a really good one and I think about posting it, but then I don't, um, yeah, I've been standoffish about posting them from our page, but I'm tempted to from time to time, just when there's something like, oh man, people really need to hear this. Yeah. Sometimes (laughs) they're just too long. Like I don't, yeah. If you stick through ours, I know that you can suffer through an hour-long podcast. Yeah. But, um, you know, sometimes I, I don't want to put, like, an hour-long interview up or yeah. whatever. Uh, but from time to time, uh, you know, somebody like Scott Horton will occasionally do just these little 20-minute interviews. Yeah. That can be really informative and really interesting. A lot of information kind of yeah. condensed down. Um, so, you know, if, if I come across some of those, I'll, I'll put them up as well. But, like I said... 
Follow us on Facebook, iTunes, Podbean, wherever you get your podcasts. Hopefully, it's one of those two places because that's where we are. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll try and get it right next time. Until then, try sure. and stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later.